Welcome to Watching Silent Films. This is Yifang. With me are my co-hosts, Adam and Emily. Hello. Hello there. Hey. Greetings, greetings. Um, just wanted to, you know, say that our podcast is one where we pick a, a film or a series of shorts, watch it and talk about it. That's what we do here. And uh, make a real quick announcement. Uh, this will be, I think, number 50, episode 50. So by the time it gets to 52, 52 will be our final episode. We're going to sail into the sunset, but uh, more on set, I think, a little later in later episodes. It, we'll dig into it more. But this time we're going to talk about Sunrise uh, by F.W. Murno, A Song of Two Humans. I think it's the subtitle. It's directed by F.W. Murno. Before we get going there, let's do a little bit of uh, what we've been watching in the classic realm. You guys watch anything interesting since the la- we, we last recorded? I began watching a little bit of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes on YouTube. Um, Ah. A little bit was cut. I I have not finished it, though. I am so bad at that. (laughs) But I want to keep watching the movie, so I'll have it finished by next week. Maybe you'll watch the last five minutes first and kind of... No, I started from the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) Doing piecemeal, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah but i mean it just it was a suggestion right after sunrise so i was like okay i've never seen it before so oh. why not trust trust uh google's algorithm right <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, possibly hopefully uh were you on to me sure okay uh, i didn't want to interrupt um i tackled on something a little bit big i don't know if you've ever heard of it it's called judex from 1916 1917 uh, it's French. It was a serial. Uh, it has a prologue in 12 chapters. Um, I saw it on YouTube first, uh, but that, they, there was no music there. So I went to Canopy and I got it there and had the music and it was a better print. Uh, it was kind of interesting, you know, historically anyway. Um, it might be one of the first pulp heroes, uh, at least on film. Um, yeah. It's a predecessor of The Shadow. There you go. Um do you know the story at all? Uh, why don't you tell it since you've seen it? Sure. Um, well, anyway, it's um, it's a masked vigilante. Uh, his, he goes by the name Judix, which is Latin for uh, judge. He fights against criminals led by the corrupt banker Favreau. Uh Basically, what it starts off with is um, they introduce a ton of characters in the prologue. I mean, there was more than you can even take in. But with 12 episodes following that, they managed to give everybody something. Um, What it was is this banker, uh, 20 years previously, uh, got money. I forgot how he got the money, but he used it. And basically, he was uh, cutthroat all the way through. He would ruin lives, drive people to uh, suicide. And one of those was uh, Judix's father. And that's what basically started him doing this. Uh, He he wanted to do something with the family. I I don't remember what the scandal would have been, but... um, the father couldn't take it. He he commits suicide. There was two brothers. Uh, they go away somewhere. So they're basically working together, and it's not really a masked uh, situation at all. He just wears, I don't know, an outfit almost like Zorro without the mask. It's just all in black, and he's got a cape. I think they all have to have a cape. Um, and it just kind of went on its way. I mean, the uh, director, um, Lewis, uh, what's, what's his name? Lewis Fayette. Uh, before that, he did *Le Vampires*, yep. which was another serial, and he used the same woman as the uh, the bad guy here. And then before that, he did *Fatimas*. So this was his third way out. The previous two people were complaining that it uh, glamorized crime, and so this was his way of turning that around and giving you a hero. Right. Um, the so what he did was he he sent letters threatening the banker, saying if you don't give your money to charity. Um, you know, you'll come to harm. And so I think it was a birth. No, it was either an engagement party or birthday party or both. Um, but he, uh, the banker a- appeared to have died. And so everyone, as far as everyone was concerned, the banker died. Uh, but in reality, uh, Judix kidnapped him with his brother and held him prisoner. Uh, and meanwhile, the daughter honored the letter and gave her wealth to charity uh, and basically lived poorly uh, the thing I thought was interesting, this was 1916 and French, so I didn't know, you know, what the custom was, what the culture was. Uh, she had a son that she took with her, with her, 
and eventually he meets up with this kid who's uh who's uh, an orphan and homeless and he's kind of like the artful dodger uh that's the kind of character he was playing uh you know lifting it from uh, oliver twist and i i thought it was weird i i didn't really understand what i was seeing it's uh her son just kept kissing him all the time on the cheek and i says well that seems more than i've heard about europe it, it just didn't seem uh, i just didn't understand it so i looked it up and uh they had a female five-year-old or so playing a male and she had a crush on uh, the guy that was playing opposite her the kid uh so i just thought that was interesting um you know it went on they just like i said they introduced a, a lot of different characters they went through a lot of drama he kept uh the banker in the cell and it was like they were trying to show what they considered high tech uh they had a mirror opposite the peephole and wherever the prisoner went they could move the mirror around uh to follow his every move and so when the prisoner tried to uh do something to the mirror he got electric electrified um so this went on for uh, 12 episodes. Uh, they would try different things, had different storylines, and then it all tied up at the end. Uh, basically, everyone, uh, you know, one bad guy found his father was out of jail after being put there because of the banker. The mother had passed. Um, you know, there was just all these different plot lines that were kind of like zooming in and out of each other, and then it all finally came together. Yeah, kind of like the early uh, soap opera days. <laughs> <laughs> well, a combination of that and like Flash Gordon type thing or Shadow type thing, right? Which is uh, later, right? These are all predecessors of that, right? Right, but it's it's instead of being too soap opera ish, it was more more like a superhero type thing. Although he didn't really do too much of anything, he would show up, but it mostly they had such a huge cast, they really couldn't even use him that much. Right. Uh, but it was interesting, and they did have a 1962 version, which I actually did watch too, just to see him. The storylines tied up, and he did play. He did pay a good homage to it, um, but uh, you know, I guess the the director of that I don't remember his name was um, might have been related to the original. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me. Yeah, film film serials are uh, kind of basically uh, uh, staples of filmmaking since the, really the beginning. I mean, there's a uh, really early serials um the american c- serials from the silent era was the the pearls of pauline oh yeah i can't see uh, a good copy of that is there a good copy of that i don't know where to locate that but that's yeah a popular it's on youtube one. but it's not it's it's hard to watch yeah and um the exploits of elaine by path ferreras oh, is also i don't know another. that one uh, if you just Google the um, Wikipedia for sil- uh, uh, what's it called, serial film, or uh-huh. it gives you a, a list somewhere, and it basically tells you kind of the story of the serials were popular because it's one of those things that it's a it's typically you know how it's shown right in in right. The releases in, in the cinema is that usually you'd have a uh, variety show and the variety show would include these serial episodes you know episode one and maybe a comedy right before the feature film at the end of the night right and that's buffered by live action like in in real life vaudeville performers and whatnot or variety shows so well it was really uh, early in the game so um, right and so these are incredibly popular because what the concept behind this is, is that you would have somebody going on the first night and you see episode one and it's like well how do you get them on the hook to return for next week right. and so on. So, you know, of course you develop episode two and on and on and on. <laughs> so cliffhanger. So you, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the whole kind of notion, right? They developed even especially during the early part. And of course, you know, it c- became incredibly popular in, in, in the twenties, thirties and beyond. But of course, until TV came along, right? Cause right. ultimately they're basically doing TV soap opera yep. way before the original TV soap opera came along. And, when TV and soap operas uh, came along, it essentially displaced the 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 serial in the in the traditional film medium, right? Usually, right. the shorts would be be shown in front of the feature films. That was kind of the the interesting things. Uh, the closest thing that nowadays, which you know, is a it's a callback or paying homage to the to the, the old old ways, is the uh, if you ever watch any Disney slash Pixar movies, uh huh. Mm-hmm. At least I, I, the last ones that I saw in the theater, they still were doing that. But 
sometimes they show a short, right? Like, um, what was the last one? I didn't go see Onward, but before that, there was um, Toy Story 4. They would show, like, a short. Or some Frozen stuff, they would show, like, a short. Right. Mm. Of of some sort of demonstration that they were testing, you know. Usually, it's a technology demo. But it's also a very short story behind it, you know. And, of course, like, Pixar and stuff, they collected all these shorts too and packaged them but if, which of course you know all of them would be incredibly aware of film history and, and all of that is paying homage to right to the early days well I, what surprised me is these seem to be three reelers uh which was kind of long for a serial i thought right um so yeah that that was that was my viewing yep yeah that's great because uh that we hadn't really the closest thing we talked about was one of the ep- uh, maybe not episode, but like a trailer for Phantomus. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I remember same director. that. We just didn't, we we just didn't get into the three hundred minute material. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, yeah, the more you peel back, next. the more you peel back, the more you're like, there's just so much to watch. Even oh, God, the silent yeah. era, even with ninety percent lost, that ten percent it's still tremendous the volume. Yeah of work that you don't even know if in an entire lifetime you could actually tackle all of them. You know what I mean? So. Right. That's great about the silent era. It's just a virtually inexhaustible supply of films to watch. Yeah. I'm finding that out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that yeah, was I, a project. It was like watching Netflix and binging. <laughs> yeah. 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 Essentially. Yeah. Because that's what we've been doing. Although it's coming, I think it's coming back to episodic here and there. But for the most part, we've been doing it serial-wise. You know, a season would be basically what I just saw, a season of Judex, which is you know funny because everybody's always, um, I guess, being surprised that oh, this is the first time it's been happening on TV and well, the TV that you know, but it's been happening since the dawn of films, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> Serialized storytelling in episodic format, it's been happening since the 1900s, you know. <laughs> right, right. So the more people get shocked by all these things that are happening, the more you're like, well, if you know anything about film history, it's really, you know, all part of the course. It's well, it's just... funny people have been pushing Shit's Creek on me for so long that <laughs> I finally looked at it. And I'm saying this is basically what the whole 60s was, fish out of water from A to B. It's almost like Green Acres. It was very close to Green Acres, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I I don't even know if the uh, creator of that content knows about that. Maybe they're either... Oh, he would. uh, Knowingly or unknowingly? uh, uh, That I don't know, but he's uh, pushing 70, so he would have known about Green Acres. Right. Uh, Because it's a father and son team who put that together. And right. uh, the father's been around forever. He was in the the American Pie series. Huh. Yeah. The father with the eyebrows. He's most you can. The first thing you see about him is his eyebrows. Oh, that's, Eugene uh, Levy. That's yeah, it. Eugene Levy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the son. I think his name might be Daniel. Uh, it's basically mm-hmm. they they're the ones who created it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, to me, I mean, people who are telling me about this never saw what I saw in this. You know, from '60s TV, and I'm like, it's the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, just um, coming back. Well, there's nothing new. Yeah. Oh, of course. All right. Well, I myself didn't uh, get around to catching anything. I think I I seen bits and pieces of things, but I didn't really. uh, Nothing I would say chalk up to classics or anything like that. So, Mm -hmm. well, let's move on. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Let's get into F. W. Murnau's Sunrise. Uh, This was a film that was released in 19. 27 I think mm-hmm. yep. Correct. Yeah, 28 or 27 27 and uh, many people have proclaimed this one of the greatest if not the greatest silent films film just film of all time I can and, see that uh, yeah and it's the first it appeared in the first uh, Academy Awards and was uh, awarded the best not best picture but it, it, it Totally created category called Unique and Artistic Picture yep. at the first Academy Awards and never appeared again. So it's a category that was created for this picture, and that was it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> they haven't created this category in all subsequent award shows. It's just the first one, and they're like, this is so unique. We're creating a separate category just for this movie right. and giving it the award. 
They could um, have totally actress. used that throughout all of this time. Oh my well, god! Anyway, <laughs> the the actress uh, Jenna Gaynor won the yeah. uh, award. She's the, I think she's the wife, right? Yep. yep. So she's she won. She's the, the wife for this yeah. one. She was in A Star Is Born, the first one. The original, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the original, original, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um. Yeah. So uh, you know, won a lot of claim in uh, from the time it was released, and uh, also just throughout the, the 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 years, it just continues to be ranked really high. And in the '80s, it got inducted into the uh, Library of Congress. Pretty certain. And uh, so yeah, and the plot is um, essentially uh, we got this farmer guy who's raising a family with uh Wife and kids. The farmers played by uh, George Bryan. The wife played by, as we just talked about, Janet Gaynor. And uh, they have a kid they're raising. And this uh, woman from the city comes along, stays behind, and is basically tempting this man to leave the family behind uh, to join, to go to the city. And essentially, you know, she pr- proposes that he kill uh, his wife and sell the farm and just uh, do away with the life. And uh, he tries to do that, but doesn't. And then ultimately, uh, the wife uh, feels rejected by him, and they go on an adventure to kind of re- rekindle their marriage. When at the end, on their way back from the city, back to the rural area, they uh, a storm overturns the boat, and uh, she, uh, you know, seems like you know went overboard and was dead, but. Uh, it turns out not to be. That's kind of the end. We're just gonna spoil everything. So, it's fine. <laughs> so then uh, the uh, woman from the city comes back and he rejects her one more time. The woman's found again, and they kind of happy ending essentially. So that's the plot. Um, yeah. As uh, frequent listeners of this uh, podcast knows, I am a big fan of F. Mur- Murna. The Director, I find all of his uh, films, in- including the ones that aren't like Sunrise, <laughs> which mm. is really popular. Uh, but uh, I find all of them really rich and full of uh, incredible techniques of film direction and uh, just somebody who actually thinks about shots and sort of figure things out. So, uh, you know, it's not a surprise that uh, when he this is his first American film, he would have been recruited by William Fox, um, which is the guy behind Fox Studio. Yeah, <laughs> that you know finally is uh, got folded now nowadays into Disney. But for a long time, that Fox that name was um, produced by you know William Fox. That's the guy, the, the namesake that runs that studio. Is that the same as Twentieth Century Fox? Yeah, it's it's all the same sort of same umbrella, Fox. same okay. guy. Yeah, so William Fox is the original, because you know in the beginning, the, all these studios, right? You got like the Paramount, the MGM, the Warner right. Brothers, and you got all these people overseeing all these various studios, and you would know them if you kind of study a little bit of film history, by like Louis B. Mayer mm-hmm. would be one of the MGM guys. Um, he's one of the M's of MGM, right? Right. Or uh, Warner Brothers, both of the the Warners, you know, and obviously, well, Disney is the, the namesake still there. Yeah. Fox is one of them. Um, what else is there? Anyway, th- there's a whole bunch. They're all just, you know, they're the the movers and shakers, right? The original guys who, who created these studios, that run the studios. Uh, Branding is everything. It, it is, but it's interesting because this guy, it wasn't very successful. Uh, Fox, uh, throughout all of the first run and the first uh, 10, 15 years, maybe up to 20 years of, of their of their existence. Hmm. His films, he's his sort of uh, modus operandi was to recruit the best artist and create the best story because he is so adamant and maybe prideful maybe or arrogant. I don't know what the word you want to use, but there's a good biography on him. I can't remember, but if you just Google his biography, there's either one or, or two, maybe just one, because nobody has written about him. And somebody who knows one of his very distant uh, grandchildren or something uh, ended up contacting them and writing a whole biography on him himself, William Fox, and basically 
it wasn't as successful as any of the other studios because his basically he wants to 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 make the best movies and he his thought is that if you make the best movies the audiences will come and pay him with a load of cash which is not true <laughs> as we know yeah <laughs> with now 100 plus years of history so oh, yeah. his his films have largely been kind of failing including this one it's not it wasn't a huge box office success when it first came out and people's response kind of muted it only gathered in steam i think in time right mm-hmm. as with a lot of classics so just a little note before we uh, get in there. Um, so let's uh, start with Lily. What what do you think of uh, Sunrise? I think it's interesting that they say it's one of the greatest films of all time. Because at first I didn't really see it. But I can see how it has definitely influenced movies in our generation. Because like at the very end, I t- completely saw Titanic <laughs> with the water. It was just, I mean, I... Uh, The movie makes me very emotional, (laughs) but, uh, it was just very interesting with the parallels, you know, of like searching for the wife over the water with the lantern and like, Mm. you know, seeing the reeds just disperse and like, I'm thinking of the bodies that happen like in the movie. And I actually try to see if like there was a reference of James Cameron ever, you know, I'm sure he has seen Murnau films, but you know, if there was that one specific link so that part of the film I thought was like just the way it tied into now was excellent. Um I th- thought it was very interesting how it you know Murnell still kind of delves a bit into the psyche and what I wrote is just you know there's like the split personality of the husband he's going from you know in the insane I called it like insane murderer of like trying to either kill off his wife or kill off his lady or you know being you know the love of his wife's life it was just very interesting and i kind of i don't know i kind of wish those were played with a bit more because you see him like go through the struggle and attempt the murder and then he gets kind of normal and then he repents and then he kind of gets back to being a genuine man again and then he loses his wife so he goes through that psychosis kind of in a repeat and then he tries to go kill the woman you know what i mean i'm just trying to figure out how like that was supposed to be laid out but it could just be acting you know it could all just be up in the actor's mind too um and our, and part of this film was interesting too because i assumed it was gonna be another horror from Murnau, even though it's been some time since nosferatu was created um so, you know, it's a romantic narrative, but it does slip back into the genre of fear when that that thing, those, excuse me, when that's happening, you know, like losing his wife or, you know, the horror of murdering somebody. Um, You could tell, too, he was just kind of, like, at the very, very beginning when all these things were, like, in motion and... All this, the city was coming out to life. I was kind of just a little confused about where we were supposed to be going. But once it kind of smoothed over, it seemed more straightforward, of course. But I, I, I definitely liked how Murnau laid out the intertitles and just kind of the overlays between, you know, while the husband's thinking about killing his wife, the woman comes in and kind of like pressures him to you know off her and i'm trying like double i don't know ifang is that double exposure when uh, the woman's face kind of comes over his body and like whispers in his ear sometimes i get them confused uh it it can be Uh, in this particular one uh the way he would create the effect would be to um oh what's another movie we've seen many of these uh, Mm -hmm. uh before Buster, actually, Buster Keaton's done many of these techniques. Um, so what happens, you take the same exact film that you film for a scene. You, and, you, you know, let's say you film the left side of the frame. Right. You, then you take the same film, thread it through, and then record the right side of the frame. Right, right, yeah. So I don't even know what the term for that is, but you just you would just continue to build uh, the material using the same exact film until you get the final product. Mm-hmm. Because this this film was made before what's called optical printers. Optical printers is like 
you basically take two pieces of film and join them into a final product. So that makes this process easier. So you could do stuff like fading and all that jazz like without playing and tampering with the actual original negative. But, you know, George Melia, of course, you know, mm. from the 1890s to 1900s has been doing this, you know, in his back experimental lab since forever. So, you know, it, it's the technologies and the technique has been there. It's just how to do it, you know, and how it gets done more efficiently in time. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I have to say that I was a little, I was running about that same exact scene because I know if you mask off for one, you can you can composite together, but have her share the same space as he is, but be over him. I'm just wondering if they had the male actor stay there through both takes. That way only she is, um, you can only see through her, but nothing else. You know, when well, she think, was hugging him? Yeah, uh, I, I that, think you'd have to. That just seemed like it was hard. I think that. you'd have to he's basically they're in, in this particular film they're basically taking the same negative and running over and over again until they get yeah. what, what they needed it which is risky because if you screw up and it gets yeah. chewed up right you lose however long days of work in the first take <laughs> so, worth the yeah. risk though that's what many filmmakers do they have to take those risks otherwise yeah it's crazy. It's all for nothing. And I just want to say, when we were talking about Buster Keaton, I'm looking it up. It, he, we did that in the Playhouse where yep. he overlaid himself. Oh, yeah. Just as a reminder to the listeners. <laughs> so the, the biography I was referring to, I found, is uh, written by Vanda Kreft. Or, I don't know, Kreft. But it's uh, the man who made the movies, the meteoric rise and tragic fall of William Fox. So we'll probably link to oh, that okay. in our show notes. It's really fascinating. I've never read it, but I seen uh, her interviewing with other podcast people and it's pretty it's pretty good it's pretty good from what I hear <laughs> huh. anyways anything else Lily I'm trying to think um, well I just one thing I was very surprised at how young Janet Gaynor is in this movie I believe I did the math so she might be 20 or 21 where her husband uh, is possibly like 30 something i didn't check his age math but i was like oh man this i don't it was just very surprising to me because i was like oh my god she's so young because i remembered her name from a star is born even though once again have not seen it but i was trying to be like who is she who is she you know that was in color (laughs) i know wow yeah and it was 10 years later after this one i believe it's that one came out in 37 i think so Mm mm-hmm so uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, just kind of like almost uh, a Mary Tyler Moore, Dick Van Dyke version mm-hmm. of like the age gap. So I thought that was unique as well. Well, I don't know. Unique's not the right word, but just an interesting choice, definitely. I think that happens a lot in movies. The women is like a lot younger. Yeah. I mean, possibly it's like another reason for why he would want to be with the woman, the city girl woman whatever because it's like oh you know she's she's an adult and she's you know a real woman where he's got like this chick (laughs) you know this young this young girl who's barely had her feet wet in life so it's like yeah why not come over to the city with me get rid of your get rid of your child (laughs) yeah so the wife the uh jenna gaynor was born in 1906 so by 1926 she would have been 20 ish i would say uh, George O'Brien, the farmer main character guy, is born in 1899, or roughly. So he be, yeah. would have been roughly 27 ish. Oh, oh okay. I mean, that's not that much of a difference. But he looked a lot old. It's so funny with age. It's the makeup, right? Yeah, it's the oh, makeup. Um, and the city girl was born in 1895, so even older. <laughs> mm. Well, I think I think uh, George is a bodybuilder, and sometimes that makes you look older. Yeah. Hmm. Um. I don't know. I don't have much else that really impressed upon me. Some things, uh, it was just kind of like, I almost saw bits of slice of life with their relationship and trying to culminate what they had lost within like the 10 minutes of him trying to decide if he wants to offer or not on the boat. And she's just like, Oh no. Ah, I can't save myself. Ah, you know, (laughs) (laughs) 
But I don't know. Maybe one of you will bring something up and it'll jog my memory. It's a uh, sunrise. I mean, I I liked it. I don't know what else I can really say about it, though. It's definitely yeah a form of expression <laughs> of the human soul. <laughs> Song okay. of two humans. Uh, Adam? Well, um, Adam, I you... liked that there were two incredibly wealthy uh, right. couple. How about um, one of you guys? You know, they had lakefront property. They had a uh, servant, you know, a nanny. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how good can it get? Uh, I know f- just from listening to um, the commentaries when I watched it um, that uh, they wanted to make it look European. Uh, so you didn't have the feeling that you were in America. You were someplace in Europe. Um, there was the article uh, that iPhone gave us called The Turn and Return of Sunrise by Dudley Andrew. It was written in 1984. And the one that, thing that struck me is the first titling is um, the, uh, the human condition between Oh, the condition between two humans, the story between two humans. Yet there's three people sharing the same level of uh, credits. Uh, Margaret Livingston, the vamp, being the third person. Like a force of nature. So he thinks that she was kind of thought of as inhuman, you know, causing a rift between the two humans, you know, almost like a a natural disaster. Uh, Something, you know, luring him into something that he couldn't say no to. Uh, So... Almost like a storm coming, and Murnau's known for uh, highlighting storms. She was kind of that storm in their relationship, and basically how he overcame it, and how he could easily slip right back into it. And she was the innocent. Yes. Uh, and then they exemplified that toward the end, where they're coming back after an idyllic, uh, you know, when they they got back together and they were in love all over again, the storm happened, you know, so it was almost being... It's almost saying, you know, you know, it's not over yet. Uh, you think you've conquered this, but no, here comes the storm. We're going to throw some more in your direction. And the vamp, uh, the woman from the city, just seems to be part of that storm, you know, part of that evil, part of that uh, situation that they have to overcome. So it's the story between the two humans, but she's the the element who's basically, you know, the villain in this piece. I noticed when the fonts started happening, in the titling, I got a Frankenstein uh, vibe from it. You know, it, it felt like the same type of fonting that the uh, Frankenstein would use. And then it seemed to, um, even later on, just seeing him, the way he was dressed, he was dressed kind of like Frankenstein. And when he was coming back from the vamp's um, apartment, uh, they put lead, lead um, weights in his boots, so he was walking like Frankenstein. Uh, when he was in the boat... Uh, almost going through with killing his wife. He was very Frankensteinish. Uh, I just thought that was interesting. The thing that struck me almost right off, and I think it did everyone, and I and I think what really put it in my head was the commentator, uh, was the wig that they had her wear. It just made Janet not look like Janet. Uh, it, it, it was just very, very unappealing. So you can almost, it was almost showing you how he went to the vent because she was more stylish, where... Uh, the wife was just very down to earth, practical, not romantic and not exciting. I'm a big fan of models. Uh, and right off the bat, uh, they had the model train. Well, first they start with the, the drawing, which melts into the the model. Uh, there was so much composited in just that very, you know, in that beginning scene where they had the model train, the real people, uh, the matte paintings of the buildings behind that and another model train coming through the other side. I noticed I've been doing uh, some research, although I'm not an expert on it, as far as how sound started about this period. And I've noticed that the um, the aspect ratio is a little tighter because that's when they used to put the soundtrack on, I think, the left-hand side of the film as you're looking at it. Uh, and that way they can include the music and the, the sound effects and the crowds and so on and so forth. So it was, it was almost making the jump into uh, sound, but didn't quite do it. Oh, uh, one thing I noticed, I, I looked at some posters of, um, you know, advertising the film. And when you see the poster and you look at the husband, he looks like someone that from today. Um, not so much when you see the movie itself, but when you see the posters, he, 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 you almost do a double tape because I said, was this just taken? Did they put someone else there? Uh, but then when you see, you know, the movie itself, it's it, you can see it's of its time. But the, but the poster, it, it looked more um, not so much her, but he did. He looked more um, recent. 
Uh, the swamp scenes were talked about. Um, you know, it was a tight set, but they made it work so it looked bigger than it was. And uh, he did something that I don't know if anyone else ever did. Uh, well, the commentator was talking about the second person, um, Struess, Cal Struess. He was second in billing, but he actually did most of the work because Charles Rocher, um, he was sick, and so he had to hand it off. And he might have been the one, but I'm not sure if I remember that right, uh, that he, first of all, he, he put the motor on the crank so it was turning the film by motor instead of hand cranking it. And then the swap scene was completely in studio, so he had the camera mounted on top by the ceiling and then just guiding it so it followed him almost in a figure eight to make it look bigger than it was. Uh, let's see. Although the amusement park, even today, you don't really see that many visuals all at once like that. It's almost like a, a music video where there's just so much coming at you. Only it's not digital. It's it's whatever effects they use. Some of it matte paintings, some of it modeling, some of it people in the background, some of it composites. And it was just it was just so much. You know, if you would freeze frame it and just look around, it, it was just there was a lot to look at. Uh, the photographer, I just got a kick out of it. I don't know if I've got him right, but he was in uh, the, the TV Superman when it was a pilot. Uh, it was an episode called Superman versus the Mole Men. And so he played the, uh, I think he played the security guard, Pop Shannon. Uh, so you get to see him a little later on. Um, I like to follow people around to just see where they pop up or if you can even hear what their voice sounds like. I've actually been on a Conrad, Conrad Veidt uh, kick lately uh, looking at his sound films. Uh, when they were in the photographer's studio, uh, it was just funny where they were acting like kids again, as if they were like 15. Uh, but I know the music went with the, um, it was what was on the film, so it was shot then. But I questioned it when all of a sudden I heard bits and pieces of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour theme song that you always hear before the TV show started. But I looked it up, and it is an older piece from 1872 uh, called The Funeral March of a Marionette. But um, I, I just, it, like I said, it threw me off. I, I, I just thought someone was messing with the sound or maybe something new was put there. But no, that was a piece that existed. Uh, not sure why, but um, there was a lot of money being spent when they were um, going through the city. They were making a lot of um, focus on the fact that they had opened up their tiny little purse and kept spending the money that they must have been saving forever uh, just to pay for this, that, and the other thing. Uh, there was a lot said about the train they took going through the, uh, through the country and then the city, and that might have been a chassis put on top of a, a car, and that was made up especially to basically taking you from one situation to another. Uh, it was nice the way they used the horn when the wife was thought to be drowned and he was ca calling for her, and uh, they were using the horn to uh, basically make the sound as if they were calling for the wife. Uh, the boats that were looking for the wife, it was just a great shot. It was darkness, but you see the boats and then the lights oh, coming from the land. caught all that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of great points. I mean, I definitely, once you run out of the, the wedding band, I do come very close remember to the, seeing, uh, camera, you know, calling right to the camera on for the him wife. several times within this film. Uh, and the last and thing right, was, I, didn't really I just pay noticed the her, uh, wedding ring. They really made sure you saw that on his hand. I didn't really catch it if it was on, if you saw it on hers, but on his, you almost saw it all the time. Yeah, back to your point a little bit well, that's it about me. the uh, film aspect ratio. There are two surviving master prints. One is uh, Cali, one of the LA school. I, I can't remember which one, but UCLA or USC. Right. One is one of the other. I can't remember now. But the they had a print there, and right. there's another print from Czech uh, Republic. And so Put, they were pushing the, the one that's from here <laughs> is the one that has is uh, the left side or something a little lopped off because of the they had the soundtrack mm -hmm. because this is similar to uh city lights um in the 1930 something with uh um uh, chaplin where oh wow it's a silent film but if you play it it actually has a soundtrack laid out because it contains the score yeah. some minimal uh, sound effects and i think this particular film had the same exact thing so what we're listening to 31. today is a yeah. restored kind of reconstructed yep. version of that whether whatever they have I, I couldn't quite quite find out if mm -hmm. it was exactly from there but it's it's something that uh was meant to go along with the film by the time they they released this uh, because you know it's right at that time frame where uh -huh. the jazz singer 
is arriving and things were um, were right. being changed um, in terms of sound technology. But in Europe, it was totally silent. And that's why in Europe, the check print had the complete aspect ratio because they didn't have to deal with the soundtrack was at all. So most of the restoration probably came from the check print so that you could see all the missing left columns, but at least something like 5 to 10% of the picture or so um, of the frame. Mm-hmm. So that's the restoration piece. Um Going back to some, or also uh, the sort of, I guess I think both of you made a little bit a point about this, but the interesting thing I thought of was the sort of the duality, uh, the dual nature of what he was trying to examine kind of comes in play across all, almost every single element of the movie itself, right? So it's the song of two humans, so it's got two people, and like you were saying, the the city woman is more of a it's similar to remember the wind we talked about how yeah the, one of the male characters in there is almost like the wind right he uses the personification of a natural force right at work which of course that director is the guy that originally inspired uh, fw myrna's um obsession with nature oh, okay. uh, hmm. b- being an element of his movies right in even uh-huh. his earlier movies, uh, Myrna's movies, we've seen how nature, um, you know, what's that guy with the, uh, I forgot what the title is, but the, the, the dog hunt movie where it's all raining um, all the time, constantly, the storm outside. Yeah, the castle. Um, yeah, the haunted castle. That's what Haunted castle. Yeah, so. Oh, by the way, I've seen that term used again, so maybe they did call it Mansion's Castles back then. Yeah. <laughs> So, so that was so, always bugging me. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of a common thing that he he basically was inspired by a man there was, you know, that of course, you know, the 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 Swedish director made. Anyways, back to this uh, film is that this woman like like those films, the character herself kind of represents that element of force, but also that there's a difference between man and woman and that's you know, exactly personified of, you know, different desires, needs and you know, human sexuality and stuff like that. And so I think it's a part of what he's trying to express. Also, you know, it's based on the short story, right? Excursion to Tilsit by uh, Herman Suderman um, way earlier. But the concept, I think, is brilliant because it's it's not just man and woman, but also like city versus rural, you know, uh, light versus dark, the sun versus the moon. You know, you've got many, many expositions and many many shots of the moon when it comes to women and the sun comes to the man or vice versa like there's this contrast of uh, man and and woman and sun and the moon uh, the day and the night the light and the dark uh, the city and the rural uh, uh, the water and dry land Uh, you know it's just amazing how you know, it it seems to be a simple picture, but beneath the 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 surface, there's all this incredible, rich uh, symbols of um, what all of those elements uh, play up to be, right? And if you remember the commentary, because you you we I think we listened to the same uh, commentary by by Bailey. Would he ta- he highlights how there's even like uh, throwaway pieces of the Maya characters where. You've got men and women, strangers who sit next to each other and kind of how they relate to each other, you know, <laughs> throughout the picture, right? You know, you know, even from the start of uh, when he's getting uh, a haircut or something and the the wife is sitting next to the, the man and how, you know, there's complexities there. Or later on when they're back, uh, you know, one of the guy who found her, you know, rescued her from drowning the wife uh was sitting next to i think the the nanny right or maid or whatever and they have their own sort of uh uh spat <laughs> yeah their own piece until his wife was like you know what's going on here in the background you know so there are all these interplays of like um many different motifs weaving in and out um so that's a, a incredibly rich backdrop of this film, uh, which you know, if, if having seen several 
Murano movies by now. It's a common thing. He he's been doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah, throughout all his films there are all these dualities and this contrasting nature of you know, this and that, right? There's always these dual natures at at play and forces at, at underneath the surface fighting with one another, right? Mhm. Mm-hmm. So, if anything, he's just kind of bringing that back to the forefront. But also that he's doing it with a big Hollywood budget now that he's in Hollywood and he's... Yeah. I like the uh, comedic scenes with the um, the strap coming down all the time and the other guy kept fixing it. Yeah, that was the other that was the other scene too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then finally he was just like, ah, oh, the heck with it. <laughs> <laughs> she slaps him, yeah. <laughs> the article said something about that, how it... it... It turned into it went from comedy to violence. You know, she slapped him, yes. but I think he overstated that a little bit. It was just, <laughs> it was just funny. Yeah, but that's the thing is that it, it is. Uh, it's got all these themes throughout the whole film of like all of those contrasting points, right? Um, right. But above and beyond that, I think he he's also bringing a lot of uh not as uh big as the uh Caligari the expressionism but like if you look at the all of the set buildings right and all of the aesthetics they're all very much callbacks to well all the rooms had these uh floors that were you know none of them were flat there were a lot of them were at an angle coming from the door yes on purpose right yeah it's right the call because even the the film itself uh again it's, i think from some of the commentaries and materials it, None of them had actual names. All these characters right. had like the man, the wife, woman from the city, the maid, the yeah. photographer, the barber, her uh, obtrusive. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So it very much is a. Uh, Just. It's a almost parable. like a fable, right? There, it's not trying to be realistic. It's trying to be saying. It's trying to make a point about. Right. What it is about these, you know, it's it's the whole concept of like. Uh, women from Venus and men from Mars. They're also they're also different. How how can they all relate to one another? Uh, and well, also, well, you can tell it wasn't supposed to be taken seriously. That when he first ran out of the house to go to the vamp, and she was just ready to serve soup, she was dejected. And I couldn't tell if the two women talking about her were in the house with her, or if they were outside, or or what that deal was. So it just felt very fluid. It just you weren't supposed to take it too seriously as far right. as the space and who's in, who's invading which space. Right. Mm. Or even for that scene too, it's like, did she, I mean, I you have the feeling that she knows this has been going on for a while, but it's oh, yeah. never, it's never really addressed. And I feel like, it, not that the ball was dropped there, but I don't know. It was just kind of, you think she'd be more mad in that respect of her, you know, losing her husband to the the this vampy lady. And then, you know, then he tries to kill her and then she's all upset. And I was just kind of like, I just felt like for Jana Gaynor's character's emotions, they were too far flung and not. Right. Not she's too yeah. much the martyr at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much the martyr, which also not a bad theme to follow. But you have to have you kind of have to slide into those emotions. You just can't go from one extreme to the yeah. other unless you're bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> she might have been. <laughs> well, yeah, but it doesn't come across that way in the movies. No, no, so, no. If anything, the vamp was. Right. But I think the the, the point wasn't so much the uh, realistic human relationships. I think the point yeah. more was it was more of like a, a fable. A, or A medieval fable, yeah. Yeah, it's more mythic than just uh, based on real life. And I think that's why it's, that's why there's so much of like all those elements I mentioned, right? Mm. And, and so there's less of realism, but more just uh, what all these characters represent behind them, the ideas that they have, you know. Um, I was wondering the woman from the city. Uh, this is my own conjecture. I'm not sure I found this in any other, not, not that I did extensive research, but the things that I read about, but. It seems to me like her job, I mean, it says she's vacationing, but also felt like the women from the city had an ulterior motive of convincing people in the rural area and the farmland to sell their oh. materials right, yeah. to get rid of the farm thing. And to me, almost like, uh, I might be reading too much into this, but it feels almost like industrialization a little bit of like, maybe because that was the 
the the time period it's actually post industrial age you know, a little bit you know it's like people are moving on beyond that now but it's like you know you're in the farm you're in society get rid of that and you know sell your stuff like he had to sell his they didn't really get into the reason why the man had yeah. to sell his cows or some stuff like that mm-hmm. usually films are, when they introduce something they pay it off but that never paid off uh, exactly so i'm wondering if she was the in. one yeah. The woman in the city who convinced the man to sell the the cow and that got okay. the whole family into a deep rut and either she's taking money for herself or she's working on she's working on behalf of a large corporation. <laughs> I don't know. This is all no, no, I extra totally stuff I'm it. leaving into it. But it, it's just so interesting that she is she represents that sort of element of uh instability, right? Of uh of uh wreaking havoc on not just this man and woman, I think also I think in that rural town. I think it's just like, that's why people are like whispering yeah. when she's around or doesn't, you know, take her, take to her kindly because she's, again, is representative of, you know, uh, you know, what, what everything that is from the city, you know, the fears from the city is, you know, <laughs> I love the set design um, of where she was staying and she goes into the room where her, I'm guessing the landlords were right. eating their mail it was set up like this crazy cartoon, uh, very German expressionism, because their table was like tilted up to the left, our mm. left. Uh, she's coming down this uh, very steep incline. Uh, yeah, every, nothing, everything just it was like shoved together, almost like a cartoon. Just something. It was like very Cal- Caligari-ish. Oh sure, I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously he 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 would have known that he would continue to to expose all the things that he learned from right. Max Reinhardt, you know, so because Max was the guy who inspired you know uh, Robert Wien and everybody who's doing uh, expressionism, you know, is, that's kind of the they all kind of came up together <laughs> or yeah. would have known each other, you know what I mean? Right. And so incredibly inspired by all those things for sure. Um, yeah, I just love the visuals. Oh yeah, I mean not, uh, all of the visuals like, again is I think I've said it to the death but after be Myrna's visuals from a technology from a technical perspective is just second to none. This is why. Well, look at the church. They uh the commentary said that uh, that sun ray was painted there. Hmm. Well, maybe. He he says he he's he's, he's doubting that. Yeah. He's doubting that because Oh, it, really? Yeah, it was like the people you know, it, there's claims that there's you know, you paint the light into the wall, which right, right. sounds like something the expressionism would have done. But I think expressionism painted shadows, I think, more than lights, you know. And so, like, he thinks that it's just, re- you know, real lights. And But the fact that, you know, know. Yeah. through that entire scene, the couple would move from the dark into the light and then, you know, back out again. And it's just the whole rich symbol of, like, their own rededication, you know, yeah. of their own uh, marriage and when they come out of the church and there it's now taking place in the community. Right. And right. It, it all adds to the point that it's not so much that they're actually representing real sort of. Right. Right. You know, but you always want to know how they do certain things. It's I know more Ebert just was stumped for the longest time about the camera through the swamp. And then finally someone told him. Right. It's more just about the, the fact that they represent concepts behind them. Right. You know, so, and how, of course, they had to go from the uh, the uh, the rural to the city to find themselves. The farthest point away from you know yeah. where they are basing based their uh, where their life is based. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but the whole thing, yeah, that was a great film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just laughing over here. I'm like, yep. I do have to agree, even though I don't fully agree with what happened in the movie. But it, yeah, it, it, it's it's not supposed to, to play out like a uh, like well, a, a a natural story of a uh, a real person in, in a real relationship. Mm-hmm. I think it's all tied together. In the fact that it's almost like a, a mythology. It's like a fake, uh, you know, a fable or a, yeah. Um, a but I almost feel it's fairy it's, tale. It's, yeah. You know? it, I feel that way too, but it's in the sense that this was made in the twenties. I almost feel like it—it it is a, a movie of its time. Like I—that's th- my 
that's well, that's when my grandparents were born in the twenties. But I almost feel like you think of that time period in civilization, and it's kind of like a gentler time where compared to now, we're all like fierce and kind of oppressive. Yeah. I don't know. It just in that respect, you know, you see this movie and you're kind of like it's very gentle with like the love part of the marriage. So. Well, even they were out of place. Because uh, they were showing how busy and sophisticated life was within the city, mm-hmm. and they were kind of out of place there, but they liked looking at them because I think they like to feel, okay, this is this is a gentler time right in front of us when they start doing the peasant dance, you know, the summertime peasant dance. Yeah, that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. I love the uh, hair salon. It was um, it it looked like the early thirties because Art Deco seemed to be creeping in, mm. and it was just so grand. You know, it was just so big. Yeah, I mean, we I think we can go on. There's just uh sure. to me there's there's a lot to talk about with Sunrise because of the sort of uh heritage of Myrna and how he was recruited by William Fox to do this really artistic picture and I I I think William Fox the probably was thinking he got more than he bargained for. He was just yeah. thinking, oh, it's going to be a good picture. He was like, "Whoa, what is this thing?" you know. <laughs> that came out of this, you know, you know, I'm not sure they even know how to sell it after it was made, you know, yeah. so, um, but we can, I, I think, wrap it up for now because we do have to talk about one more short after this. Sure. So mm. any, any parting thoughts about this before we move on? I'm good. Just for me being like, you know, the youngest of the group going from Nosferatu to seeing this film from Murnau and not knowing any of his other films in between. Um, I like how, you know, his, I love how directors can branch out into different formats and themes and Mm. still, you know, hold that title of, you know, his name. You know, that weight is there just saying, like, this is, you know, I own this movie. This is my film. You know, go see it. I hope you like it. And I don't don't know. It just kind of, like I said, I expected more of a horror because of Nosferatu, and I'm glad this wasn't. And And even though it tied into the themes of, like, you know the horror and thriller genre and whatnot. Um, I'm well, I was pleasantly surprised by what I watched. So good yeah. movie. <laughs> I'm curious about his next one called Taboo. I'm gonna check it out. I think. It's oh, that's his final movie. movie. It's a documentary. Oh, oh, I didn't realize. Okay, it's yeah. silent though, isn't it? Or is it? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. It's it's like this picture. the the tra- The soundtrack is laid out, so it's right. it's gonna be synchronized to the film. It's just uh, yeah, I think it's it, Criterion, so I'm gonna check it out. It's co-directed with uh, Robert Flaherty. Now, if you don't know anything about oh, Robert Flaherty, yep. Nanook. you do. Nanook. Yeah, so he's yeah. one of the yeah. first, if not, or early pioneers. I don't I can't. I don't want to use first a lot, but early pioneers of documentaries in general. And he. Uh, well, he'd fake them, but yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of the point is who which documentary today doesn't really fake them anyway. Well, that's true. <laughs> it's a very they interesting really insight. Fake. It's no, a really no. interesting <laughs> insight, even in the beginning of film on, on what is a documentary. Is it something that is shaped by the storyteller or is it actually something totally objective? And the reality is you can't be 100% totally objective when you're cutting and editing together something to present to people. You, you, you have to take a point of view, even if you feel like you're not taking a point of view. You know what I mean? Actually, what really got me started on this trip I've been on for a while now was someone gave me a book just as I was leaving a job called A Thousand and One Movies to Watch. And that's where I found Nanook, and that's where I found many others. <laughs> Somebody gave me that for a birthday present. That's funny. Yeah, I still have yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and I've been seeing, because of Criterion, I've been seeing most of them now. Yeah. I th- I think I've seen most of the... Uh... <laughs> But that's yeah. how I saw Nanook. Like, yeah. How'd they get that camera in the igloo? And sure enough, that was faked. Well, that's the thing, you know. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's a whole other. Huge. Yeah. That's a whole other. Yeah. <laughs> topic onto itself. Um, but with regard to um, Murnau, he he did a variety of I feel like uh types of movies. I mean, he did um. Right. What what was the f- thing we saw first? Journey, Journey into, into Night. He night. did yeah. Haunted Castle, which we saw, and then he did uh The Burning Soil. And then after that. that, Nosferatu, and then Phantom, and then he did the the finances of uh, Grand Duke, The Last Laugh, Tartuff, Faust, The Last Laugh, and after that he came to do Sunrise, and then after that he did Four Devils, 
It's generally regarded to be his best work, which is Lost. Which one? Unfortunately. Oh, okay. Four okay. Devils. Now, if you have the DVD still or the Blu-ray, you could actually watch, quote unquote, watch the Four Devils using a construction of still photography. It's quite interesting. Hmm. So check it out if you have time. Uh, it's on one of those, uh, the disc menus somewhere. It's just called okay. the Four Devils Reconstructed or something like that. Yeah, the DVD, not Blu-ray. So, yeah, we'll see. It should be the same. But anyways, um, that was quite interesting. And then he did one more called City Girl, 1930, before he did the uh, Taboo. And I would oh, say okay. almost all of those tackle different genres and different types of topics. So That's an artist. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, he died really young, you know. Yeah. With, car accident. Uh, yeah, car accident. So, anyway, that's that. Um, we're going to move on to, I totally forgot to mention, but um, we're going to tackle the uh, Lauren Hardy's uh, The Battle of the Century. You guys managed. Oh, and before we get there, I just thought of something I, I should just mention about the uh, um, Sunrise thing because it just came to me. I, I, I should have mentioned it earlier, but I totally forgot until now. A lot of it was uh the way the man the movement of the man did was like uh, you mentioned frankenstein but as i was thinking more of the golem oh, okay the 1915 um film with yep. uh paul Wag- wagner yeah wagner. i think i saw the one after the fifth 15 was the first one or yeah no? yeah I, saw, I must have seen the second one the polished one yeah he did it twice yeah and anyway, so that's kind of the the whole concept he it's a takeoff of well, that character which yeah. is obviously kind of inspired Frankenstein as well. Probably. So, anyways. <laughs> well, my, that's the my outfit he was wearing, it looked like Frankenstein. Yeah. And plus he's a bodybuilder, so he had, you know, everything came together. All right. So, let's move on to uh, Battle of the Century. What do you think of this uh, little short ditty, Lauren Hardy? I've never seen a Laurel and Hardy picture, so I really liked it. Um, and we... We'll have this in the show notes too. The video you sent us too was also extremely interesting about how a lot of the film was missing for a very, very long time. It's probably like ninety five percent complete now, but see so knowing that at one point it was thought to be a completely missing film is you know, it's it's funny, you know, you see these films and you I don't know, you can't imagine that they're all gone, but you know, the reality is they are because I don't know, maybe some kids lit them on fire <laughs> in the middle of a burning lake. I saw that. <laughs> you know, so so basically I was talking about for the next scene, uh, the, the pie throwing scene was one of my favorites in this film because of how absurd and ridiculous it was. I really like the pacing and timing of how it was completed, though, because it is it does stretch for a long amount of you know watch time and you think okay this is kind of a little over the top and a little ridiculous but it flows really well and you know it just kind of keeps going you know you got one two three four ten twenty forty sixty people eventually all throwing pies at each other and even though it's just like it's the same gag repeated because the way it was styled and you know all these different people from walks of life the ridiculousness of it made it just that much more enjoyable. Like, I never felt annoyed watching the pie fight at all. I just thought it was genuinely funny. You know, it's like, the, how many times do you ever get a pie thrown in at your face in your life? Never. So now you get to see 200 people get a pie in their face. <laughs> but yeah, I don't remember what else I said after that. Um, Battle of the Century, good film. Uh, for someone who doesn't know much about Stan and Ollie, I, I'm going to watch more of their stuff. Um, I know we mentioned more of their stuff is popular for the talkies. I think we that's part of the original podcast, though. So I'm going to stop, and Adam, you can take back over again. Thanks, Lily. Um, I've always been aware of um, Laurel and Hardy, but I've never really followed them. And I know a lot of people have imitated them. I, watching Gilligan's Island, you're basically watching them. Mm-hmm. Growing up during the 60s, I, I was watching the 60s. I grew up in the 70s. Uh, I was watching Dick Van Dyke all the time, and he used to imitate uh, Laurel, uh, Stanley Laurel. And um, they were also friends together. So when he did a whole bit that was basically one of his routines, he asked for feedback, and Stanley basically gave this long list of things he did wrong. So he took it like a trooper, and you know he understood, and 
he, his friendship meant more than getting mad. And he actually gave the eulogy at Stanley's funeral. So that shows you how close they were. Uh, I've been watching the festival as far, as far as silent films go uh, from Italy. And they had a lot of features of uh, Oliver and Hardy separately. I mean, um, Laurel and Hardy separately. Uh, you'd see Stanley's things and you'd see all these things. Uh, so to see them in silent film together, that was something different. The one thing that really struck me, uh, it was nice to see the um, documentary beforehand about how they found the second rail. But watching it, I'm thinking to myself, was that supposed to be even the same uh, film? I mean, I saw nothing that tied reel one with reel two at all. Uh, they were in s different situations, doing different things. Uh, I've noticed a lot of silent films, seem, or even the Three Stooges for that uh, part, uh, seem to like doing boxing gags. Uh, especially, uh, I think it was City, was it City Lights? Or, or one of the f uh, films by Charlie Chaplin that um, it was even one of his favorite scenes because uh, it takes a long time to set something like that up where it works out well. Uh, pie scene on the second rail. I'm not usually um, a fan of pie fights because to me, I, I just never got it. But the way they did it was actually funny. And it was long. It was the longest pie fight I've ever seen. But their timing, I've been watching a lot of silent films, uh, even comedy ones, where everything seems sped, sped up either through undercranking or just through, um, just through uh, their timing. So what I saw... Uh, and I know Stanley was the biggest writer of the two, and I'm sure he set them up. Everything from the banana scene that led up to the pie scene, uh, it, everything just took its time. You know, it was very deliberate. It wasn't, it, it just wasn't sped up. It was just well done. Uh, the mayor showing up out of nowhere dressed up the way he was was something straight out of a Monopoly, a Monopoly game. You know, it's just, it, it was like an archetype of what a mayor should look like. Uh, which I'm sure they had that in mind. I think my favorite part of the um, the scenes was, I think, toward the end, where the, uh, the pie hit the floor and not someone directly, and the woman was walking by, and she slipped on it. And just the look she had on her face, it was so natural. It didn't look like uh, something that was forced, something that was scripted. It just looked like she might have actually... I mean, I know she didn't do it. Uh, I, I know the whole thing was staged. You could you could kind of tell, but at the same time, it looked very natural, and she looked truly embarrassed about the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I can see why this was a lot of people's favorites. It was nice to see the second reel, because uh, the first reel was nice, but the second just it was almost like an extra. And that's it. Yeah, it was City Lights, by the way, the boxing scene. Yeah, yeah. Which was uh, a, you know, a uh, they brought it back from when he was doing shorts. He'd been doing that too, mm -hmm. which, which everybody and their grandma, if if you're in the silence and you're doing comedy, has done. I'm sure <laughs> something about boxing, you know. <laughs> um, but the the thing about the uh, multiple storyline, it's pretty common, I think, for a lot of silent shorts, is that they they don't always have to do one another. They usually have various scenes, and you transition from one scene to the next to the next to the next. So, mm -hmm. typically, half a reel to one reel is one scene before they go to the next reel. And so even a two or three reel or comedy routine would be e usually two or three different stories loosely tied together. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't see any tie. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, because I think the, some of the transitions were part of the lost era, I think. But anyways, uh... the, the, the banana thing I thought was interesting because I don't remember which one now, but we did see a um, Buster Keaton one Battling where, Mama. I I can't remember the details. There, he was getting chased, and there's a banana peel on the ground. And of course, you know most comedians are slipping on the banana peel, but the joke is that you never do, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. the thing of a Buster Keaton. And so, with uh, this one, they did do that for the first however long it it, it went went on for. It was just like, you know, uh, Lauren Hardy they were like, "Let's do it, let's do it," and then never did get done. You know what I mean? So that was the gag, but the but the pie thing was uh, tremendous because I think um, you know like the behind the scenes thing I linked they, they were you know everybody's done the pie thing for a long time but it it really is the or maybe it was the no I, was, I probably heard this on um, an interview with the one of the archivists uh, trying to restore the uh, recently there's a thing called the uh, a a definitive collection what's it called. 
The different re- oh, yeah, restorations. Yeah. Lauren no, Hardy. Criterion. No, um TCM. Yeah. How oh, is it that? You talking yeah, about Lauren released- Hardy? Yeah, yeah, it's a release this year in uh, June 16th. It's a compilation. Remastered uh, Lauren Hardy films released yeah. by TCM. Uh, I think either UCL or USC uh, did the remaster on them. But the point is, this is uh, part of it, this this particular short. But the, the, the point is that it also that they, it's it's more that when they proposed this idea, the five fights had been done to the death. Like, nobody yep. <laughs> wants right. to do another one. I, I think their proposal was to see, what if we did the granddaddy of it all so that it would... Be the pie fight to end all f- pie fights, and so so the the quote they were quoted saying this may have taken more than three thousand green pies, or maybe ten thousand. Who knows? Like, wow. but that's supposedly wow. in the Guinness Book. Huh. <laughs> it's Who funny knows? that the Three Stooges continued that, considering it was already done to death. Well, you know, comedy's comedy, yeah. but um, the point is, that at that point in time, there it's spectacular, right? Because you've seen pie fights before, or at least even in the silent film era, but not not to the degree where it's one thing after another it just keeps escalating right so yeah yeah it's but, fun but yeah that, that also is my favorite part it just uh, it's also not something that you you kind of have to know the context to to be funny i think this is one of the things that you can just drop any modern audiences in and without any context they will find it funny that the pie the pie fight part mm-hmm. you know what i mean Almost definitely. Yeah, I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna show this to my kids. I'm sure they'll. <laughs> oh, they're gonna love it. Oh, well, because man. it's one of those that like, you don't really. Again, you, you, you should. Yeah. The best ones are the ones that you really don't need to understand right. for the context, and you you kind of get it, you know. So, but there have been silent films where it might be funny because I know a lot about the context, and that's what makes it funny. But if you drop today's modern audience it's in straight, they might find bits and pieces of it funny, but it's really not as funny as it could have been, right? So, yeah. But this is definitely one of those where... Well, like I said, it, it was relaxed. It took its time. It didn't speed right. up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's absolutely a classic in that regard. Yeah. So, <laughs> highly recommend it. Um, it's on YouTube for now. Um, and uh, it's also part of the Definitive Restorations uh, by TCM released earlier. I don't know if it's a limited edition, but uh, if you're able to, you can buy the whole set. I think most of it is talkies, but they they do they did find a, uh, this amongst other a few other shorts in the silent era. And uh, yeah, I I also like you you guys haven't seen a lot of their uh, uh, material. I think, but they have been in according to this 34 silent shorts, 45 sound shorts, 27 full length sound features. And, uh, yeah, so they, they're, are, uh, have had a career in a half, both right. independently as well as together, you know, that's, that's what we got in that. Okay. All right. Very so cool. that, that wraps up that short one on the Hardy's, uh, battle of the century. And that was, let's see what year that was. That was 1927, 27. Oh, same year. Yeah. 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 I wonder if that was the short before that movie. Ah, <laughs> uh, who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> all right, when, uh, that's pretty much all we have for tonight. So, thank you, listeners. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Lily. And uh, next week, I believe it'll be the last one for Adam. I think. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, you can find more of our stuff at watching silent films, plural, dot wordpress dot com. Again, that's watching silent films dot wordpress dot com. Send an email if you have any thoughts, comments, ideas. Watching silent films, plural, at gmail dot com. And please leave a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts, wherever you find our podcasts from, and go from there. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Ciao.